Okay, it's 10.02 and I think we'll get started. So again, welcome to today's webinar. And it's an overview of the environmental impact statements or EISs from NPD and WR1. And first, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that the NPD site is located on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people and that the WR1 project is located on the Treaty 1 and Treaty 3 territory, as well as the homeland of the Red River Métis. As an organization, CNL recognizes and appreciates the Indigenous people's connection to these places. And CNL also recognizes the contributions that First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made, both in shaping and strengthening the communities where these projects are situated and to this country as a whole. As mentioned, today's webinar is an overview of the environmental impact statements. And basically we've looked at the process, we're gonna look at the process of the environmental assessment and we're gonna look at what, how that is and then what we found out during each of the environmental assessments and what, what's presented in the EIS or environmental impact statement. Um, as usual, we'll start with the presentation from the project teams and then we'll open the floor for a Q&A and discussion period. Before, we hand, before I hand it over to Katie and Jeff, who will be presenting, I'm going to go over a few housekeeping details. So as usual, there is simultaneous interpretation of this discussion. You can access this session in French and English through the globe icon on the bottom right of the bar on Zoom. So you just go down and select the language you would like to hear. Please note there is a slight lag in the translation, so please wait for the full translation to come through before speaking. Um, please speak clearly and uh, okay. And then today's session, we're planning it for just under an hour, so we're hoping to start to wrap things up around 10 to 11 or uh, 10 to 10 for those coming in from central time zone. Please use the Q&A icon to submit your questions at any point during the presentation and then we'll respond to all the questions at the end. Uh, note that we are recording these sessions too and we'll be posting them to our YouTube channel afterwards. And we circulate those links to the YouTube recordings as well. And if you are having any technical issues or if you have any questions following the webinar that we didn't get a chance to answer, um, or that come to you after the webinar, don't hesitate to get in touch with us at ermstakeholder at cnl.ca or through the white shell communications inbox at wlcommunications at cnl.ca. So now I'll introduce our speakers. Presenting today, we have Katie Shorter, the manager of regulatory approvals for the NP Closure Project, and Jeff Miller, the manager of regulatory approvals for WR1 decommissioning. And before I hand it over to the project teams, we're going to start with an opening poll. So Rachel, if you wanna queue up the starting polls. Okay, so the first poll there is, did you attend the last webinar in March about NPD and WR1? And then we're also looking to see how familiar you are with the environmental assessment for NPD and how familiar you are with the environmental assessment for WR1. So we're just watching the results roll in here. So we've got, looks like most people are somewhat familiar with NPD's environmental assessment and maybe not as familiar with the WR1 environmental assessment. So that's good. We can learn a bit about that today, increase a bit of knowledge. And it looks like most people did attend the March webinar, but around half didn't too. So again, this will be a new, looks like it'll be some new information today for people. All right, so if we can share those poll results. And 
That looks good. And I think we'll hand it over to Katie and Jeff to share the presentation. Uh, yes, uh, good morning, everybody uh, across Canada and both uh, Eastern and Central uh, time zones and wherever else you may be today. Uh, my name is Jeff Miller, and while I'll be kicking things off, uh, Katie and I will be tag teaming today's presentation. Uh, today's webinar is focused on giving you guys a general overview of the environmental impact statements for both WR1 and NPD. Can I go to the next slide, please? We'll start, as always, with a brief introduction of the two projects for those who are joining us for the first time. And then we'll walk through what the EIS is, what's in it, and what conclusions it reaches before wrapping up with a Q&A session at the end. Next slide, please. So first, uh, a little history. Uh, WR1, or White Shell Reactor Number 1, is located in Pinawan, Manitoba, and played a key role in the nuclear history of Canada. It was built by General Electric and first achieved criticality in 1965 serving for 20 years as a research reactor, uh, which among other missions, missions uh, became a testing site for the Kandu, modern Kandu fleet. It was safely shut down in 1985, and since then has been maintained in a state of storage with surveillance. NPD, or Nuclear Power Demonstration Reactor, is located in Rolfton, Ontario, north of the Chalk River site, and was the first Canadian nuclear power reactor and the proof of concept demonstration for what became the Kandu reactor. The NPD reactor made history in 1962 when it became the first nuclear power plant in Canada to produce electricity, and it became a proving ground for research and development that led to commercial application of the CANDU system for generating electric power. The site has also been in safe shutdown since the 1980s. Now, these are both legacy reactors dating back to the dawn of the nuclear era in Canada. WR1 as a research reactor and NPD as a CANDU demonstration. Both of the, these reactors are built subgrade, so built underground. They're built onto or into the bedrock. Both have been maintained safely in uh, storage with surveillance for over 30 years. And both of them are uniquely suited for what we call in situ disposal. Next slide, please. Now, in situ disposal is the disposal of these reactor facilities in place. That is not to remove them, but to leave them right where they are. What that looks like for these reactors is backfilling of the facilities with grout, which is a flowable cement, leaving everything below ground in place. The grout encapsulates the materials and stabilizes the facility for the long term. It turns the very substantial concrete structures of the reactor buildings into a permanent multi-barrier waste disposal facility that provides passively safe containment of the materials over their hazardous lifetime. But before we can execute these proposals, CNL has to undergo a federal environmental assessment of both of these projects. Next slide, please. Now, the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act of 2012, or CIA 2012, and its regulations form the framework of law for federal environmental assessments in Canada initiated prior to 2019. For the purpose of CIA 2012, among others, is to protect the environment from significant adverse environmental effects caused by a designated project and to ensure that designated projects are considered and carried out in a careful and precautionary manner. Now, environmental assessments of projects under CIA 2012 are conducted by a, what's called a responsible authority, uh, which is usually one of three federal agencies. In our case, it's the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, or the CNSC. CNL, the proponent, we prepare an environmental impact statement, or EIS, that contains all of the relevant information and assessment data that the CNSC requires in order to make a determination of our impacts on the environment. But now to take you a little bit deeper into what an environmental impact statement contains, I'm gonna pass things over to Katie Shorter of the NPD decommissioning team. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, good morning, everybody. I saw a note in the chat that it's overcast in Pinawa, but not raining. Um, it is sunny here in, uh, I'm in Deep River, so um, I'm enjoying the sun this morning. Uh, so a little more detail on uh, our assessment methodology, our environmental impact statement. So uh, an EIS follows a structured methodology uh, to determine whether a proposed project has an effect on the environment. To start off, we identified valued components. These are both uh, general and then more specific aspects of the environment that we want to ensure are protected. So the VCs are environmental features that may be affected by the project and that have been identified to be of importance 
uh, by the proponent, government agencies, indigenous peoples, or the public. And the value of these components not only relates to their role in the ecosystem, but also the value that people place on it. Uh, next step really is to establish the study areas. So uh, a site study area in, in very close proximity to the project, a local study area that looks a little bit broader and then a regional study area. These are all around our proposed project sites. And this is where we would expect that there may be effects or impacts from the project. Uh, next piece in the EIS is to provide a description of the existing environment. And that describes what are the conditions at the project site right now. And then, you know, the meat of the assessment is to look at the different ways the proposed project may interact with people and the surrounding environment. Uh, and then we also look for mitigations that can be used to minimize the effects on the environment. Um, finally, we need to look at um, where we might have effects on the environment, the significance of these uh, potential effects, and then also consider cumulative effects. Uh, so the effects of both uh, our project on the surrounding environment and other foreseeable or nearby projects. So the structured methodology to assess effects to VCs um, looks at different aspects of the environment. So if you look on the right hand side of the slide here, uh, we have what we call the environmental components. So these are the areas that we go in, we look at to see how the project uh, might affect the environment. Um, so just a note, as we go through, you'll see that uh, we do actually group our VCs, our valued components under these uh, relevant environmental components. Next slide, please. So all the information that we've used to select our valued components to establish the baseline environment and perform the assessment comes from a variety of sources. Uh, this is existing data that we have about our sites, um, new technical studies that have been done to further advance our understanding of each site. These are site investigations of underground features, wildlife surveys to understand what specific species may be impacted, and also detailed characterization of the reactors themselves. Um, further to this, the EIS incorporates knowledge and feedback from Indigenous communities and the public as a means to improve our understanding of the existing environment and to ensure the assessment looks at things that are most important to the people who live near these sites. Um, as we go through the presentation today, we're also gonna highlight uh, instances where we've had feedback from the public or indigenous communities. Uh, and we've used that feedback to update our EIS or the assessment. Uh, so those are flagged as we continue along today. Next slide, please. So since the inception of our projects in 2016, when we uh, issued the original project description, CNL has been reaching out to Indigenous communities and the public who may be affected by the projects. These engagement activities help CNL to gather feedback and input to improve our understanding of the local environment and the aspects of the project that are most important or concerning to Indigenous peoples, the public, and other stakeholders. With many of our local First Nations and Métis, CNL has been able to establish formal relationships and, and contribution agreements. And these provide support and allow Indigenous communities to participate in the EIS, sorry, the EA process for the projects. Uh, CNL has uh, supported Indigenous and traditional knowledge and land use studies. Uh, and that information has fed into our EIS to provide a more comprehensive picture of the current environment. Uh, and, it, and these studies provide significant insight into the aspects of the environment that are most important to Indigenous peoples and also their commitment to act as stewards of the lands and water. So CNL engages in, in a number of a variety of ways with Indigenous uh, communities and peoples. Um, sometimes, um, these are uh, community meetings, working group meetings on a more technical level, directly with chief and council, or through liaison and advisory committees. Uh, and, and we target or tailor that communication based on the desired desires of the individual communities. Next slide, please. 
So just a little bit more about some of the ways we try to reach out to public and stakeholders um, to uh, share information about our project and seek feedback. So presentations and information sessions, site visits, although uh, there hasn't been site visits in, in a while, given our uh, restrictions under COVID, but we hope to have people back out to the site, both sites again soon. Um, participation in public events and media relations, we use social media. Uh, we've also had some virtual open house and then our regular project updates at our webinars and technical briefings like we're doing today. Um, and really, there's sort of two mechanisms uh, where we gather feedback. Um, one is, is in, in a more formal way. So these are formal comments that we've had submitted through the EA process uh, on CNL's EIS. But then obviously there's some more informal interaction uh, and discussion at public engagement that's helped us gauge uh, the public stakeholders' uh, interest in the project. Next slide, please. Okay, so moving into what, what happens in the EIS um, or in our environmental impact statement. We're looking at uh, impacts to the environment and, and really we come to one of three assessment outcomes. Um, so first one is there's no change to the environment and therefore no residual effect. Second one is there is a minor change to the environment, um, but still no adverse residual effect. And finally, uh, a change to the environment that causes a residual effect. So we look at both the effect the project may have on the environment, but then we also consider the effect after we've applied appropriate mitigation measures. Uh, potential effects can be either beneficial or adverse, and it's only the potential adverse effects that we carried forward for assessment. When we have effects that are likely to occur after the use of mitigation measures, this is where we have residual effects. When we have a residual effect, or we predict a residual effect from the project, uh, the next step is to look at significance. Um, and uh, residual effect can either be minor um, or it can be significant. Uh, and a significant residual effect um, with a significant residual effect, additional or more effective mitigation to reduce, the, to reduce that effect is not considered possible. So a few things that we consider when we look at significance are the magnitude of the effect, so the size or degree of the effect compared against baseline conditions, the spatial extent of the effect, so the geographic area over or throughout which the effects will be measurable, the duration and the frequency of the effect, degree to which the effect can be reversed or mitigated, ecological importance, uh, and human health, the degree to which the physical aspects of human health may be affected. So I think we'll move on to the next slide and we'll just talk quickly about the environmental components. Uh, back us up one, Mike, thanks. So this is uh, the areas of the environment that we look at. Atmospheric, geological and hydrogeological, uh, aquatic environment, uh, human health, land and resource use, socioeconomic environment. Uh, and one of the things I like to highlight here is that uh, some of these components can contain VCs that have been identified for the project. But in addition to individual VCs within those components, they also act as pathways for the project to interact with VCs and other components. So if we take the atmospheric environment uh, as an example, uh, Jeff is gonna jump in in a minute here and talk about uh, the valued components and the potential effects we might have on the atmospheric environment. Um, but the atmospheric environment is also the pathway in which contaminants uh, from the project or effects of the project might reach surface water, the aquatic environment, a terrestrial environment, or even people. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, and just an idea on this slide, the, the boxes that are in the darker blue are really uh, identifying where uh, these environmental components uh, can also act as pathways. So at this point, I'm gonna pass the presentation back over to Jeff. 
um, and he's going to look in more detail at each one of these environmental components, the valued components within it, uh, mitigation, and the results of our assessments. Thank you, Katie. Want to just hit the next slide, Mike, please? All right, so yeah, as Katie mentioned, we'll, we'll take a kind of a quick run through uh, several of these uh, environmental components, just to give you guys an idea of some of the things that we look at in the general conclusions. Uh, we won't go into too much detail because there is a thousand pages of, of hardcore scientific uh, assessment that's gone into this, and it's far too much for a one hour webinar, but uh, we'll try to give you the gist of it and uh, try to answer any questions you may have on, on the back end. So starting with the atmospheric environment, uh, here we look at two main value components, those being air quality and climate change. And to assess these, we look at specific indicators like how the project contributes to air pollution, like sulfur dioxide, or to greenhouse gas emissions like CO2, and the emission of volatile or hazardous contaminants as dust uh, during demolition or any other uh, decommissioning activities. Now, during ju dust generating activities like demolition, the project will apply mitigation such as your standard dust suppression techniques like wetting uh, and ventilation where it's needed, as well as using a well-maintained equipment that meets uh, emission standards so we're not uh, needlessly uh, polluting the air. During our engagements, we did receive actually very little feedback uh, about air pollution specifically that would have resulted in any kind of update to our EIS. But the overall conclusion of the assessment was that emissions of air pollution and greenhouse gases, while resulting in a minor change to the environment, will have no uh, significant residual adverse effects uh, after, after the mitigations are in play. Next slide, please. Now, next, we looked at the underground environment, so the geology and hydrogeology, that is the project's impacts on value components such as soil and groundwater, their quality, their quantity, their erosion and flow patterns. Now, the project itself is designed to protect the groundwater by passively containing the hazardous materials in the reactor. Uh, and when the project is being carried out, the project will follow best practices for erosion and sediment control. Uh, and when construction is complete, we'll return the site to a physically stable and safe state to ensure that there are no lasting impacts on the soil quantity or quality, and that conditions for rapid erosion or changes to the local soils are not present. And once uh, the facility is complete, there is no means for the project to alter the geosphere or groundwater flow patterns at that point. Now, because there is the possibility that the facility may release very small amounts of contaminants over its lifetime, there is assessed to be a minor potential change to the environment. However, these amounts are not at a level to have a significant residual effect. So there is no adverse residual effect assessed for the geological and hydrogeological environments. Next slide. Now, hydrology and surface water quality are the changes to runoff rates or drainage patterns or the ambient levels of contamination in surface water. Uh, during closure, CNLs, erosion, sediment control practices, as well as our protocols for spills and leaks uh, will ensure there is no uncontrolled release of contaminants to the river and that there's no uh, surface, pattern, uh, surface drainage patterns are not changed or eroded. The final site will be graded to promote natural drainage and use the existing drainage features at the site. So in the end, there is no change overall to, to water flow or water drainage uh, to surface water bodies from the sites. Now the impacts on surface water quality uh, will stem from either groundwater or the atmospheric pathway, which were assessed to have a minor change, but no significant residual adverse effect. So as such, the same conclusion is also reached for hydrology and surface water quality, that there is a minor change, but no significant residual adverse effect. Uh, to walk us through the next three, I'm gonna throw it back over to Katie. Mike, if you can pop up the next slide, great, thank you. Uh, so moving on to the aquatic environment, uh, here our valued components are uh, aquatic vegetation, aquatic invertebrates, fish and fish habitat. And we look at the changes to the quality and or the quantity of fish habitat and benthic macroinvertebrate and fish community structure. And then finally, the radiochemistry of fish flesh. In this environment component, some of our primary mitigations are actually linked to protecting other components of the environment. For example, uh, there'll be no unassessed liquid effluent releases, uh, which would be to, surface, to the surface water environment that would ultimately lead to and potentially affect the aquatic environment. Uh, again, as Jeff mentioned, uh, the project is designed within uh, 
sort of in-design mitigation measures uh, to contain and isolate the uh, contaminants within the facility. Uh, and that is an important mitigation to protect this environmental component. Uh, some of the other mitigations that we don't have listed out here are, again, repeats of what you've heard already from Jeff, uh, appropriate erosion and sediment control practices, spill prevention and cleanup procedures, um, and, and a few others. So uh, in this environmental component, impacts can stem from uh, either groundwater or surface water quality. Uh, and similar to the other environmental components that Jeff has already walked us through, uh, the EIS predicts only minor changes to the aquatic, aquatic environment and no adverse residual effects. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, terrestrial environment and ecological health. Uh, in this uh, component, we look at the different categories of biota, so vegetation, birds, mammals, reptiles, uh, and we do put particular focus on species at risk. Uh, so here we're looking for or looking at whether the project might uh, result in changes to habitat availability, habitat distribution, survival and reproduction. Uh, and then we also look at the quality uh, of the other environmental components that will interact with the terrestrial environment. So looking at air, surface water, soil, sediment, and groundwater quality. Again, here's where you can see uh, the other environmental components actually act as pathways to the valued components in this, in this area. So uh, during our projects, uh, CNL will use procedures for environmental protection and the management and monitoring of emissions. Uh, and some of the specific measures uh, that we'll employ here are uh, conducting pre-disturbance surveys. So if we're going to do work in an area, we would walk that area down and look for species present. Uh, we will ensure there's awareness uh, with both CNL employees and contractors involved in the project uh, for the protection of wildlife during our physical decommissioning activities. Um, Heavy equipment that comes in from offsite uh, that will be inspected for um, both whether it's bringing in offsite material uh, to avoid the introduction of invasive species, um, but also um, sort of for maintenance uh, aspects to make sure it's in, in, in good shape. Um, and uh, we will have traffic moving around. Uh, Road mortality is, uh, is a challenge for some of our uh, species of interest, so we'll be enforcing speed limits and we will have signage and fencing um, where needed at uh, frequent crossings. So for this environmental component, we've received quite a lot of feedback, especially from Indigenous communities uh, who want to ensure that species of importance to them are protected. So uh, some examples of species that uh, weren't considered in individually in, in, in our uh, original draft EIS for both WR1 and NPD are things like moose, mink, river otter, uh, monarch butterflies, and, and wike. Uh, and as part of our feedback, we've added those uh, to our assessment. And, and here we remain with the same uh, predictions that there's no adverse residual effects. Uh, on the terrestrial environment and ecological health. Uh, as part of that incorporation of, of new species, uh, one example um, from NPD is that um, our EIS now includes some new requirements for maintaining uh, the existing and then replanting milkweed uh, on our site, and that's habitat for the monarch butterfly. Uh, so I guess one little exception, uh, here's the point where uh, on the MPD site, we do have uh, predict one minor residual effect, uh, and that's to uh, species at risk bats. Uh, so you can check out the image on the bottom right there. That's one of our uh, little bats, and the picture's not upside down here. Uh, the bat's hanging upside down. Uh, so in this case, uh, we have an effect that comes as a consequence of uh, the removal of a resident's hibernaculum um, for species at risk bats when we demolish and then grout the facility. So CNL has applied for a SARA permit for the damage and destruction of a residence and incidental harm or harassment. Uh, and we've also been carefully monitoring the area and the facility that's been used by bats. Uh, 
in the past, um, both for their presence, our continued presence, and also to understand the conditions within the hibernaculum. So we've implemented a plan to exclude the bats from accessing the facility, uh, and that will hopefully minimize the impact of the decommissioning uh, on the bats. So uh, in summary here, really, even though the project predicts a minor residual effect, uh, this is not anticipated to have a significant impact on the recovery of the species um, because there's only a small number of bats uh, affected. Um, we're working now to implement mitigation measures to exclude the bats from the facility um, prior, prior to hibernation activities. And there's contiguous area of forest surrounding the site study area that provides uh, plentiful habitat. So if we move on to the next slide, please, Mike. Uh, next environmental component is uh, human health. Uh, and in this environmental component, uh, the important part is us, people. Uh, we look at public health and we also look at worker health. We look at effects to people during the execution of our decommissioning work, doing, during the institutional control period for the project. And because our projects propose to create a permanent disposal facility, we also look at the potential effects to people in the long term. And we consider a wide range of future scenarios for the use of the site. Uh, and that's really what the image here on this slide is, is trying to present. So we look at uh, the proposed disposal facility, which is really just marked in this dark with dark green. Um, and then we look at uh, several different uh, receptors uh, who could interact with that facility in the future. Uh, someone who could live on site uh, and potentially have a, a small farm where they grow, uh, produce and, and animals that they ingest, um, someone using the area for recreation, so hunting and fishing, uh, an indigenous group uh, who might be using the area on the site or around it uh, in a more uh, traditional way, and then an, an off-site cottager who's really representing our sort of downstream receptor. Uh, so on, on the mitigations front, um, the other person to really uh, consider here is a, is a worker, and that's during our decomm decommissioning um, execution activities. So here we would implement CNL's uh, occupational health and safety and our radio protection program requirements uh, in the project. We would uh, do hazard identification and, uh, and our detailed work planning to ensure that the workers are safe. So uh, the other note here, again, because this is an environmental component that uh, is sort of fed by some of the others, uh, we want to ensure that surface water, groundwater, soil, sediment, and vegetation quality is maintained. And, and here we've also had feedback that has enhanced our assessments. So on the WR1 project side, when they were looking at one of their receptors, someone they call a harvester, uh, they adjusted the diet to include wike and moose, uh, and that was based on uh, feedback from one of the Indigenous communities. Uh, on the NPD side, uh, since our original draft EIS was submitted back in 2017, we've also uh, expanded the receptors that we consider um, to include a self-sufficient Indigenous receptor group. Uh, and as I mentioned before, that uh, receptor would interact with the site in an in, and the area in a more traditional ind Indigenous lifestyle. Here again, uh, you'll see a theme. Um, our ES EIS does not, neither EIS predicts any residual adverse effects uh, to the biophysical environment. So that's uh, the air, the water, the ground, um, the biota, uh, and subsequently with no effect to the biophysical environment, there's no effect to human health. I think uh, I'm passing it back over to Jeff to finish off a couple more of our environmental components. Yes, thank you, Katie. Um, now, land and resource use is, uh, is another of these environmental components that isn't directly affected by the project, um, but the project may have impacts on the biophysical environment, which then in turn may have an impact on how the land and resources at the sites can be used. 
This includes things like cultural and archaeological sites, uh, traditional land uses by indigenous peoples, indigenous peoples, and uh, future use of the site for commercial or recreational uses. Now, based on engagements with uh, First Nations and Métis communities, CNL is taking steps to further mitigate uh, potential impacts on these communities by promoting Indigenous involvement in ongoing environmental follow-up monitoring and supporting traditional or ceremonial activities at the sites where possible to encourage reconnection and healing of the land. Now, CNL has also incorporated traditional knowledge uh, and perceptions into the description of the, end of the historical uses of the site by Indigenous peoples. Now, though, as Katie mentioned for human health, as the EIS already predicts, there are no significant residual effects on the biophysical environment as a result of the project. There's subsequently no significant residual effects on the land and resource uses at the site as a result of the project as well. Next slide, please. Similarly, uh, the socioeconomic environment looks at the project impacts on things like employment and income in the area, business opportunities, government financing, community infrastructure, uh, and just general community well-being as a result of changes to the environment by the project. Now, this is a these are decommissioning projects uh, that ultimately will result in a reduction in jobs in these communities. Uh, and Siena has proposed mitigations that include hiring of uh, qualified local staff and contractors where appropriate. Uh, developing an Indigenous procurement strategy to improve opportunities for Indigenous uh, participation in contracted work or full-time positions, as well as participating in community regeneration initiatives and establishing agreements with Indigenous communities regarding relationships and cooperation on ongoing monitoring work. Now, through engagements on this topic, uh, CNL has included additional information from Indigenous communities on their perspectives on the effects on their socioeconomic environment. Uh, but as with the land and resource use, because the project is not predict predicted to have any significant adverse effects on the environment, there are not predicted to be any significant adverse effects on the socioeconomic environment as a result. And I think that is the last of the environmental components, and I will flip it back over to Katie to close us out today. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, and you're right. Uh, so the last thing we're going to talk about today, just really quickly, is uh, the follow-up monitoring or follow-up environmental monitoring for the projects. Um, and I guess uh, just to sort of point you in the right direction, if you're interested in our plans at this stage, which are our draft for both uh, WR1 and NPD, uh, you can see preliminary details directly in our EIS. So for NPD, that's section 12, and for WR1, that's section 11. Uh, so as part of an environmental assessment, uh, projects are required to have a follow-up monitoring program, and it really has two main uh, reasons for being, and that's to verify uh, the assessment predictions. So uh, all the stuff that we've talked about today, about whether we'll have a residual effect or what the contaminant concentrations might be in the environment, our follow-up monitoring is designed to uh, verify those predictions. And the other thing that it looks at is uh, the effectiveness of mitigation measures. So our environmental follow-up monitoring at both uh, WR1 and NPD is based on the Canadian Standards Association uh, N288 standards for groundwater, environmental, and effluent monitoring. Um, it's augmented by the existing programs that exist uh, on, our, on our sites. Uh, it's adaptable to incorporate Indigenous participation and knowledge, and we're going to employ uh, adaptive management throughout uh, the execution of those uh, follow-up monitoring programs, which will continue for a minimum of 100 years during the institutional control periods uh, for the two projects. Um, if you're looking for some more information about where we're at with follow-up monitoring and developing those plans, uh, NPD has had several webinars on this topic, and you can access those on the CNL YouTube channel. Um, and they do provide a really nice background on how we are developing those follow-up monitoring plans. It would be relevant for NPD or WR1 as well, just a different site and different sampling locations ultimately in the end, but uh, the, the process and the development is, is the same. Next slide, please. Uh, so I just want to close us off uh, by sort of reiterating uh, the outcome uh, or the predictions from the EIS for both WR1 and NPD. 
And that is that in situ disposal provides containment and isolation of the reactor inventories and that environmental concentrations uh, meet the assessment criteria that have been established to make sure that we protect both human health and the environment. That brings us to the end of our uh, presentation for today. I think uh, next slide is our opportunity to ask questions. Uh, so I think Margo is gonna lead us through there and, and Jeff and I will be happy to answer any questions you have on the environmental impact statements for either NPD or WR1. Thanks Katie and Jeff. A lot of great information on the environmental impact statement and how it interacts with the, the environmental assessment process. And I'm just looking at the Q&A. I think people are still maybe gathering their thoughts. We do have, as you mentioned, Katie, that one comment about the weather in Panawa. It's uh, overcast, but not rainy. And I know that's probably great because I think Southern Manitoba has got a lot of rain in the past little while and fortunately a bit of flooding too. So good that it's not raining today at least. Okay, as, as we wait for a couple of questions to get in, maybe um, Katie and Jeff, I, I don't think we went over um, how the, the link between the draft EIS, I know we talked about submitting it a few years back for, for NPD and I know uh, WR1 did as well. Um, so there's the draft EIS and then what's, what are the next steps before the final EIS for each project? So maybe I can start and, and Jeff will jump in, I'm sure, if he wants to add anything. Uh, so as Margo mentioned, both projects submitted a, a dra uh, initial draft environmental assessment, or sorry, environmental impact statement uh, in 2017. Jeff will correct me if that's wrong. Um, and uh, at that point, there was an opportunity for uh, the public and the regulator and other uh, government agencies to comment. Uh, and so since that time, CNL has been working to address uh, the comments that we received and improve our uh, effects assessment uh, and make sure we have all the information that we need. Uh, and so both WR1 and NPD are uh, a few weeks away from submitting revised draft environmental impact statements. Uh, and at that point, um, there will be a technical review by the CNSC and the federal review team uh, to see how we've done really on addressing all those comments that came in both from the federal team and, and, uh, and from the public. Uh, and at that point, CNL would expect to receive some additional requests for information from the federal team, which we would need to address, uh, and then ultimately close those out uh, so that we could submit a final EIS. Uh, and move on to um, an EA report being developed by the CNSC and then ultimately a uh, hearing if we go if we go forward. So uh, maybe Jeff, do you have anything to add there? Only some uh, only a few additional items of context. So it's since 2017 now, Katie mentioned we've been trying to address the information requests or comments from the federal regulators. Um, and as as we're uh, addressing those, uh, since 2017, the regulatory uh, environment that uh, both these projects is, exist in has been evolving, uh, both from uh, updates to uh, CNSC regulatory documents in terms of requirements that each of our assessments have to meet. So uh, we've been working to upgrade our assessments based on those changes, as well as uh, the general and important culture shift within Canada towards a reconciliation and engagement with Indigenous communities. Uh, and CNL has, has certainly uh, place a great deal of importance on taking the time that's necessary to properly and meaningfully engage with our First Nations and Métis communities. Uh, so a good amount of time over the past uh, four years has been spent uh, just building that relationship and uh, engaging with communities to, to try to ensure that we've adequately understood and uh, uh, tried to address the concerns they have with our projects. Hey, thanks, Jeff, Jeff and Katie. We do have a question in the queue that is kind of similar to what we just were talking about, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it and maybe there's a little bit more we can add. 
So Mike Addis is asking, what is the current state and schedule for EIS approval? So again, I think we sort of touched on that, but if we wanna elaborate a little bit more on the schedule. Yeah, I'll start and, and Jeff can jump in. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, both uh, projects are getting ready to submit revised environmental impact statements. And I would say that both of those are going to happen within the next month or so. That's a, the approximate timeline. Um, and then the technical review uh, by the CNSC uh, is sort of set out to take 90 days. We expect it to take a little bit longer than that. And then there's a period of time for CNL to respond. Um, Really all the dates uh, into the future beyond the date to submit this version are uh, subject to change based on uh, comments that come back and, and really the time that it takes to address those. So uh, I would say on a sort of tentative uh, schedule uh, that uh, revised drafts are going in, we'll call it now, uh, and then within about Jeff, Jeff will jump in. I think within about 12 months from now, we can expect to have a final EIS submitted and hopefully accepted uh, with the CNSC to move on to the next step. Yeah, that's consistent with my, my forecasting too, Kay, that WR1 intends to be ready to submit this draft at the end of May uh, or within the first week or so of June. Uh, again, with, there'll be a, a completeness check and a technical review uh, that lasts about 90 days. Uh, and then again, assuming a positive outcome from those reviews, uh, tentatively, we would be looking at a final EIS in about 12 months and then a, a hearing uh, with the CNSC to, uh, to start moving towards the decision uh, and looking at the end of 2023. Thanks, I think that, that provides a bit more detail there. So I don't see any additional questions. Um, oh, <laughs> yes, so that, that did, did help with the, that answer did help. Um, so I don't see any, any additional questions. Uh, maybe, maybe we can think, uh, I know I was thinking about, um, we talked a lot about mitigation measures and I don't know if we, we went into how, how they're selected or developed by the project, like how we how we choose which is the right mitigation measure. So I know there's a lot of a lot of work that goes into that as well. Katie, yeah, I'll, I'll take a I'll start on this, and Katie can jump into. Uh, so the selection of uh, mitigations is is not black and white. Um, you know, there, are, there are any number of different mitigations for any number of different potential effects. So in, in at, say, for example, in atmospheric, uh, we know that the, the primary pathway for release is going to be dust generated during demolition. So uh, we look to uh, established industry best practice and our own policies and procedures uh, that exist for how we already um, apply those to ensure that we keep our releases uh, as low as reasonably achievable. Uh, and that as low as reasonably achievable is a, uh, a theme within a lot of our industry pol policies and procedures. Uh, we do try to make sure that um, it's we necessary and then go beyond that to do what is reasonable, uh, even beyond necessary, uh, to ensure that our impacts on the environment uh, remain low and well below uh, established limits. Okay, if there's anything you want to add there. No, I think you did a great job on Jeff, on that one, Jeff. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I know sometimes we, we talk to, we get input from that from the public too and Indigenous peoples on that. Um, so I don't have any other questions and I think we'll wrap things up with a quick poll because we do have another uh, webinar this morning starting at 11 a.m. Eastern and uh, 10 Standard. Uh, if you're interested, it's on the decommissioning at the Chalk River Laboratory. So it'll be, it'll be a good presentation from the team there. Um, so let's do our closing polls and then we can, we can transition to that webinar if you're interested. And uh, thanks everyone for coming and we will share around the links to the recordings of today's webinar. Okay.
So we'll start with our one with our poll. Got just two questions and we're looking to see if you feel like you've learned a bit about each of the environmental assessments, the findings with the overview of the environmental impact statement that was shared today. So we're having lots of responses coming in. Got some yeses, some maybes. And I'll just let the poll go on for a little bit longer. Okay, so about 65% of the audience has shared their thoughts. I'm going to end the poll and share the results. So we do think people, people did get a bit of more information about the, about the environmental impact statement and the, the findings of these environmental assessments. So we hope you can join us for our next webinar and we'll, we'll share around information um, for the next regular webinar when that's, when that's scheduled. And we do have some other events coming up too. So uh, keep an eye on your inboxes or our website, www.cnl.ca slash events. Okay, thanks again, everybody, and uh, take care.